Ignacio Carrera works as an assistant professor in organic chemistry at the Universidad de la República de Uruguay. His research interest lies in the preparation of novel small molecules for the treatment of neuropsychiatric disorders and also the development of new biocatalytic methods for an antioselective organic synthesis. Now there's a word. I'll say it one more time. <laughs> <laughs> An antio selective organic synthesis. He obtained his PhD in organic chemistry in the Universidad de la Republica, and he, he coursed his postdoctoral studies at Columbia University in the city of New York. He's here to present on ibogaine and GDNF properties, and I look forward to hearing uh, what you have to share. Thank you, Claire. Sorry? The oh, the paper. Great. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm going to talk a little bit uh, about ibogaine and basic science, what we're doing in Uruguay related to this substance. Uh, so uh, the idea that is that I'm going to tell you about ibogaine and these things called neurotrophic factors, another complicated word, but I will try to, to explain what they are and what we're do, trying to do with ibogaine analogs. So I'm going to give a really brief background about ibogaine because we had this excellent panel just before. And I'm trying to make some background about what neurotrophic factors are and how are they linked to ibogaine, okay? So I, I'm going to show not as many results. I, I, I really want to see if all of you follow the, the background. That is more important for me. So ibogaine is an alkaloid. An, alkal an alkaloid is a natural product that has a basic nitrogen. Here is the structure of ibogaine. And it was firstly isolated in Tabernante iboga. That is a tree that grows in Central Africa, in the root bark, actually. And it's been used for, it, and it's, it is used for spiritual, religious, and religious purposes by the Witte tradition. In the West, the, the alkaloid was first introduced by Claudio Naranjo for uh, his uh, psychedelic properties. Claudio uh, made it, uh, uh, classified it in a different group as LSD, mescaline, psilocybin, as a different psychedelic. And he introduced it, in, I think, in the 60s as a fantasy enhancer or a dream generator. Uh, and, and besides the psychotherapeutic properties of the alkaloid, the best known property of the alkaloid was introduced by Howard Lotsoff as the beneficial properties it has for interrupting drug addiction. So there can be a lot of scientific basic research regarding ibogaine and its anti-addiction properties. Uh, like a big summarize, in the animal models, it shows that it reduces self-administration of morphine, heroin, cocaine, alcohol, and nicotine in animals. These are preclinical models, and there are those models. Regarding uh, humans, ibogaine reduces uh, drug craving for some drugs. There are no complete clinical studies regarding this. And an important thing that was mentioned before is that uh, ibogaine can induce tremors and it may induce fatal heart arrhythmias because it has a, a delicate relationship with the heart. In that, it's different from the other psychedelics too because it has uh, this, uh, this uh, characteristic of... Uh, it, it acts with some channels in, in the heart that are called the HERG channels. Uh, so it's, it's something one should be respect and caution about. So, that is about ibogaine, but what is this thing about the neurotrophic factors? Neurotrophic factors are proteins. Are proteins that were first uh, discovered in the development of the brain tissue. So, what is that? We know that, uh, I mean, the brain needs to grow uh, and to differentiate. And neurons, they don't bore like, by themselves. They, they use this process called neurogenesis where they, they got differentiated from like a stem cell, for an undifferentiated cell. Here is an experiment, actually, this, this is not happening in an organism, but if you take these uh, cells, that doesn't matter which cells are, and you add neurotrophic factors, you can see that in the time course, you can see that the cells start developing these, these projections that are going to be the dendrites and the axons of the cells. So, 
uh, these proteins were first discovered uh, mediating the growth and the differentiation of the neuron tissue. So the, the, they are important for that. But there were, later on, it was discovered that they are important too in the adult brain, and they promote the maintenance, the repair, and the protection of the nervous tissue. It's, it is important to have like, high degrees of different neurotrophic factors in the brain because they do these three main important activities. They maintain, repair, and protect the nervous tissue. I'm going to focus on two neurotrophic factors that have these complicated names here, the GDNF and BDNF. There are much more, but to link to hypogain, I will talk about these two. GDNF. GDNF is a, is a neurotrophic factor that promotes the survival, repair, and protection of mainly dopaminergic neurons. Okay? And dopaminergic neurons have been shown to, to be involved in several diseases, for example, in drug addiction and Parkinson's and Alzheimer's disease, neurodegenerative disorders are mainly affected in these types of neurons. Regarding drug addiction, for example, this is a this is, a, this is a scheme of the brain, a simplified scheme of the, of the brain, where you can see this pathway here, this circuit is called this mesocortical limbic dopaminergic system, and uh, it's mediated in, in drug addictions. This part here that is called the VTA, the ventral tegmentary area, uh, projects dopaminergic neurons in this part here called nucleus accumbens. And it can be shown that uh, Due to chronic drug administration, there are some changes in this part of the brain of this dopaminergic neuron. There is some plasticity that is going on. So there are some changes. In some sort of way, simplifying it, we can say that that part gets some damage. That part gets some uh, plasticity in a different way because of the drug take. So in a, in, a, in, a, in a certain manner, if we could add GDNF, uh, in a certain way, we could maintain, protect these this dopaminergic neurons. And GDNF was, has been highlighted as a potential target to treat addiction because of that. In some animal models, for example, it has been shown if you have, for example, rats that were used to uh, drink alcohol, uh, and if you inject GDNF directly in that part of the brain that I show, that is called the VTA, there is a decrease in the seeking of the alcohol administration. So, there are some scientific evidence that is linking this GDNF, this protection protein, for these dopaminergic neurons. The, the question is that, is that could an increase in GDNF in BTA could reset like this the reward circuit into a new addictive status? So, the main thing about GDNF is it could have like these potential properties for, for drug addiction, especially in the VTA area. What about BDNF? BDNF is another protein, another uh, neurotrophic factor that is not as so specific as B GDNF. It's not so specific for dopaminergic neurons. It's more, it, it's, more, it's more found in the brain, and it is known that it involves the simulation of neurogenesis and synaptogenesis. A decrease of BDNF content in some areas of the brain has been related to depression, and schizophrenia, and epilepsy, especially. There is a lot of data that, that links BDNF to depression. Uh, in this paper here, it, it is highlighted that uh, high neural activities and neurogenesis, cell survivors, and acid plasticity is related to a high expression of BDNF in some areas of the brain. And instead, depression is, is related to a decrease of the expression of BDNF in some areas of the brain. Are you following the idea? So, what about ibogaine and neurotrophic factors? Ibogaine has, a, has a, a really complicated pharmacology. It acts in a lot of different targets in the brain. It, it is an antagonist of the NMDA. Uh, it acts in the sigma receptor. It, is, it has a really weak properties on the 5-HT2A receptor. That is like a, an evidence of the pharmacological point of view that is a different psychedelic, as for example, LSD that uh, the, the main mechanism of action is the interaction of the 5-HT2A receptors. So this is showing that in the pharma pharmacological point of view, it is, it is a different mechanism as all the psychedelics. It also uh, acts on neurotransmission, and these are, are like the principal charges in the brain that ibogaine acts. But I won't focus on this now. This is very, very extensive. But it has been shown 
that a bogain is can be it can be reported here in, by a group here in UCSF that a bogain can promote the GDNF release in the brain. What uh, this this did the, this researcher did this is the same experiments I showed for the GDNF in the VTA. They did the same, but they injected a bogain in the VTA, and they had the same effect for alcohol. Okay. And they checked that there, in the VTA, there was an increase of GDNF in the midbrain. Are, are you following it? So this is the, the main paper that links ibogaine with, uh, with GDNF. Okay? Uh, and it, it, is, and it, is, uh, it, it is a paper for alcohol addiction, and that is important because for every drug, there is a different uh, story in the brain. So it is postulated as a main hypothesis that ibogaine mediates its anti-addictive properties for alcohol abuse via a GDNF release in the midbrain. And this is important. This is paper is for alcohol abuse. Okay. So what is our research about? What we wanted to know is what happens in the brain if we inject ibogaine in, a, in an animal model and we look for the GDNF and BDNF expression 24 hours later. The idea is that we want to know actually what the, what the drug is doing to the, to the expression of these both uh, neurotrophic factors in the brain 24 hours after the administration. We want to be sure, it, it, why 24 hours? Because we want to be sure that there is not going to be a bogain or not a bogain around. The idea is to see what happens with the brain when the drug has already left the system, okay? What happened to the expression of these proteins in the brain once the ibogaine has, has, uh, go, has been gone? That is the main idea. So in this paper that I'm showing here, this is not our data, this is, this is a publication in 2001, they demonstrate that 24 hours there is no ibogaine around and there is only a small fraction of no ibogaine that is the metabolite. So we want to see that. We want to see what happens with the neurotrophic factors after ibogaine or noribogaine is already eliminated. And this is the, the main idea of the experiments. We have an animal model of rats, and we inject two different doses of ibogaine, 20 and 40 milligrams per kilo. And after 24 hours, we do a dissection of different parts of the brain, the nucleus accumbens and the ventral tegmental area. There are the two zones I showed you that were involved in the, in the drug addiction the cortex and the substantia nigra. The substantia nigra is a, is a dopaminergic part too that has been vinculated, for, uh, for example, with the movement and with the neurogenerative diseases as Parkinson's syndrome. So afterwards, what we do, we check the amount, of, not, not, when we check the expression of the GDNF and BDNF in each part of the brain. And how do we do that? Actually, we are not checking the amount of protein that is there. We are checking the amount of RNA. We know that uh, what happens is that uh, the DNA goes a transcript to RNA, and the RNA goes to a protein. And we are not measuring in this part of the brain the amount of protein. We are measuring the amount of RNA that could be correlated with the amount of protein. This, this correlation is not like 100% exact, but it's like an indicative. Of, of if the expression is high or the expression is low. We do it with this technique called real-time PCR. I'm not going to enter into that. So this is what we found. Here, what, this is our preliminary results. We are studying this with more animals. This is our six animals for each group. For each group. Here, in different colors, you can see the cortex, nucleus accumbens, VTA, substantia nigra, and you see three columns in each one. The saline, that is no treatment. Okay? Everything is compared to the saline here. So if in 20 milligrams you find a column that is higher, it's a, it's a higher expression of the protein. And if you find a column that is lower, it's a, it's a lower expression than when there is no treatment. What we see here is that we see uh, very differential things in the 20 and the 40 milligram per kilo uh, doses. The 40 milligram per kilo is the, is the dose that has been used for animal models to, to see all the anti-addiction properties. It's a mainly, mainly used in, in mostly of the papers. And we can see there that actually we are seeing that we see an increase of BTA, uh, of GDNF expression in the VTA uh, for the 40 milligram per kilo dose. That is what it was expected according to the literature. 
Uh, another thing that we see is that we see uh, an increase of GDNF in the Sustantia nigra, uh, also for the same dose, and this could have uh, like implications for an, a neurodegenerative disease too, although this is very preliminary, as, uh, as I told you. Here is a little bit more, uh, more bigger, bigger the, the, bench, the VTA, so you can see like the, the, the high increase. And here in the cortex, you can see that although we don't have a significant statistical difference, there is a tendency that it in, in the 40 milligrams there is a higher expression. So what can we see with this? We see that ibogaine affects GDNF expression in these parts in a dose-dependent manner, that ibogaine 40 milligram per kilo increases v uh, GDNF in the BTA and the substantia nigra, and uh, this high expression of GDNF in BTI could, could account for anti-addictive properties, okay? So, now what happens for BDNF? For BDNF, you see that the, the numbers are much higher than the GDNF. BDNF is sensitive to a lot of things, so this, this is, could be inspected in some sort of way. It's very sensitive and sometimes gives an specific uh, expression patterns. But what we see here is we see a, a really huge amount in the nucleus accumbens. This is a, a, a result that we are still trying to interpret because these this amounts in the nucleus accumbens of, of high BDNF expression could be related to the ability of ibogaine to, to release some dopamine in the nucleus accumbens. So we are studying this a little bit more. But we got really interested in this, that in the cortex we see like 100 more times than the saline. And like this here is a little bit bigger. And this is important because BDNF has been, has been related as a told with, with antidepressant anti properties. Uh, I will go a little bit faster. Uh, here in the substantia nigra, we also see a, an increase. But we want to follow up on this to see if we can see some antidepression properties, uh, could explain some antidepression properties. We want to, to study that a little bit more. Uh, so that is about the neurotrophic uh, factor abilities of ibogaine itself. What I'm going to tell you now is another, uh, another part of the work we are doing in Uruguay. The idea is that we are trying to use organic synthesis to make some different uh, structures being inspired by the molecular structure of ibogaine to see if we can get some molecules that could have like a higher potency for GDNF release. Uh, and especially to try to see if we, have molecules to, if we find molecules that are, uh, don't act in the IH-ERG channels in the heart. Uh, so the process is that we do organic synthesis, that is mainly we mix things in the lab and we purify them to make new molecules. And we use a very important uh, present in the literature that this group in Columbia University with Professor Dalibor Samus found that actually if this bond that you see here in ibogaine, if we have a molecule that doesn't have it, to have like these structures that call n endolylethylisukinucleidins, they have enhanced GDNF expression in some cells. So that is a very good, good start to see. This GDNF expression was tested in some cells that are used as a model. So we, we need to check this too, but this is a, 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 like a very good finding. This is a, this is a paper. So we use organic synthesis to do this. We use this methodology. I will not enter into organic chemistry because you're going to hate me, because it's, it's like... <laughs> uh, but uh, we prepare a lot of compounds, and the main idea is that this is the, the strategy that we are going to use. We have prepared a lot of compounds. The idea is that we are going to test them in cells. In, we are going to use astrocytes from, from a real animal, I mean from the primary culture, to test the different compounds to see, to check this compound in this cell, how, how, how much GNF it can release. Afterwards, we're going to try to determine which receptors in the central nervous system this molecule binds. And the idea is to try to find a lead compound, I mean, a, a, compo a compound that can have like an enhanced uh, capacity to release GDNF. And of course, make toxicity studies and, and everything. So the perspective of the work, uh, related to the first part, I told you, we will see what happens with GDNF and BDNF at the 48 hours because the main idea of, the, of this is that maybe this could explain in part the long-term the long uh, properties of ibogaine. Uh, 
Also, we are going to, to pursue some for swimming tests in rats. That is a model for, to test for depression after 24 hours to see if that increase in BDNF that we see could be related to this antidepressant property. And also, we want to determine the mechanism by how ibogaine does this release of GDNF or BDNF. How does it do it? It is because it's an NMDA antagonist? Is it because what? And regarding the novel, the novel ibogaine-like compounds, we are going to identify the structures, and we're going to, we, we want our main objective is to try to determine the, the structure activity relationship for the GDNF release. I mean, what is the relationship between the chemical structure of the compound and its ability to release GDNF or BDNF? So this work is being in Uruguay. Uruguay is here in South America. We have this work is done by a lot of different groups that work uh, in the university and in some institute called Clemente Estable. Uh, I'm part of this group that we do the synthesis of ibogaine and ibogaine derivatives with Gustavo Ciudadano, Paola Rodriguez, Mariana Paso, Bruno Gonzalez. All the parts of the neurotrophic factor is made by Patricia Casina and Sebastian Rodriguez. The part of the animals is made by the group of Cecilia Scorza, Jose Pedro Pietro. And also we are studying in Uruguay the effect of ibogaine in the neurophysiology of dreams. This thing that we call that ibogaine is a dream generator. We have the, the group of Pablo Torterolo with Joaquin Gonzalez that they are studying what happens in the EEG of, of different rats with, with ibogaine to see what happens with, uh, with the neurophysiology of the dreams. So this is what we're doing in Uruguay and what I wanted to tell you. Thank you very much. So if anyone has any questions, you can line up at the mics in the aisles. We have five minutes and then we'll do the live streaming of the plenary panel. So uh, please, the molecules. if you have any questions, please come Which to one? the microphones. Thank you. They're going to get me through this one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I missed the very beginning of the talk, so I don't know if you covered this. My apologies if you have, but uh, I understand 18MC is a derivative of ibogaine, non cardiotoxic uh, version. I yeah. don't know if you've studied that one to see about GDNF or any kind of downstream marker release. We, we have not studied that yet. Actually, we have a collaboration with, Kenny, with Kenneth Alpert that uh, we are going to, to do that, that release. It is published that, that in one paper by the same group that I, that I showed that it doesn't release GDNF in the PTA. We want, to, we, we, we want to try to see in the real astrocyte because that was made in a model cell, <coughs> in a model cell line. We want to see in the real astrocyte from the animals if it releases GDNF2. And one more question. Some of the other psychedelics that have been implicated with uh, anti-addiction properties like LSD for alcoholism, for example, psilocybin for tobacco and whatever else, do you happen to know of their properties in modulating GDNF? Is there any kind of conserved similarities? Well, uh, actually the activation of 5-HT2A is some way to generate GDNF. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's a way that is studied. It's the activation of the receptor can mediate the downstream signals and then it releases GDNF. I don't know exactly for each psychedelic what is, what is done. Thanks. No, thank you. Where, where can I look to stay up to date with the findings of this research? Uh, well, yeah, we can be in touch. I can give you my mail. I, we're, we're planning to, to, to publish when we have the completed results, but we can be in touch, of course. Email? Yeah, yeah, of course. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi, great talk. Right this morning. Yeah. That, that's very optimistic. You know, it's, it's also useful, the, the dopamines uh, in OCD patients. Uh -huh. They have low dopamine as well. They have? So, they have low dopamine. They have dopamine problems Dop as yeah. well. Yeah. That's the problem with... with yeah, it, it, can, it, it, it actually is something that we are maybe learning from ibogaine, but can have But I don't know if you tried it. If you no. tried it with... No, 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 no. We well, have. you might, because there's a lot of OCD people. Anyway, the thing I'm going to ask you about is, okay, you found that... Um, okay, apparently you're using some a gene expression... You're looking at the genes that come out of the metabolism that's precursor to the um, these these um, uh, in inducing uh, enzymes, yeah. or, or the proteins that are generated by the genes, the actual inducing enzymes. Yeah, um, you you mean the GDNF and BDNF? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. The, the, are there enzymes? enzymes? They are proteins. I'm not yeah. biologists. No, they are proteins. Yeah. yeah. Okay, okay. They're proteins. 
Oh, okay, okay. So you're looking at the gene expression before the proteins. Yeah, that, actually, that what, way, okay. what, we're, we're, what we're measuring is the, is the messenger RNA, yeah. Yes, okay. Okay, so then the question, of course, comes up, and I, I'm sure you've done this work, but um, what other things create the, 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 the GDNF and the D, what, what's the two things? BDNF. B BDNF. What, are, are there other things like like caviar or something? You know, there are, there are a lot of different uh, different substances that that create the that. yeah. The, okay, but then, we then, we'll be talking that with 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 Claire yes uh, 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 earlier well, because there are other drugs that release GDNF and BDNF in the brain. For example, but, uh, selective serotonin recapture, okay. uh, some antagonists of MD MDMA. Okay, so so, so there are other drugs that it's actually not unique. Do. It's uh, not unique. No, it's, it's not, not unique, unique for my book. Okay, no, okay. So, it's not so, unique. I mean, I would think that those two things would be necessary every time there was some kind of thing happening in the brain because you, you need to induce growth. When you, when you want to induce the, a growth thing, you yeah. have to Yeah, and actually, for example, things. it is known that uh, doing exercises, exercise, it releases GD, GDNF. So, that being in a good em environment, it releases GDNF. All the, the things are demonstrated, actually. It's not a, only because of drugs. Okay, yeah. so, so, so then the Ibogaine is not unique in its property to do this. Th so then why is Ibogaine special? No, the point saying? is that what we are looking at is like the fingerprint of the molecule, if you want to see it in that way. We want to see, okay, because it can release GDNF or BDNF, but you see that it's in, in the differential part. You see? It's not the same in the VTA that in the cortex. That is what it makes very complicated, the topic. But what we wanted to figure out is what is the fingerprint of ibogaine? I mean, it releases a lot of GDNF oh. in the VTA, not a lot in the nucleus accumbens. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So, because that, uh, uh, in, the, these proteins and these neurotrophic factors in, in, in every part of the brain, they do something that maybe is beneficial and maybe it's not. Okay, that, well then you come to another point. In that, in that what is the significance of the fact that, that the VTA and the SN are high in this slide and they're really, sl really low on the other, with the other ends of it? Is, is the, the, like the sensibility for the GDNF? I mean, what do you make of that? Of the BDNF. I know, I know, I no, know, I know. What, we're, what we're seeing is that, for example, the VTA was the region that was implicated for the addiction stuff. So we can see that a VTA uh, uh, had increased there, and that is related to the anti, maybe to the anti-addiction property. The BDNF is another story, right? Because one mediates some responses and the other one mediates another. We can, we can talk afterwards. Yeah, we, we, we can discuss, yeah. Uh, I was just wondering if you've looked at um, dopamine levels in these rats, and even if you've just looked at something like eye blinks, which can be correlated to that. So it's like? So I know in humans, um, eye blinks are a really easy way to sort of infer dopamine levels in the brain. Have you guys ever uh, considered that or even doing a direct measure and correlating? There is a lot of work that has been done with IPOCA in measuring dopamine levels okay. in the, in the nucleus accumbens, especially to, to, to see if IPOCA could increase or decrease the dopamine levels mm -hmm. that, uh, that, for example, cocaine or methamphetamine mm -hmm. generates in the nucleus accumbens. There is a lot of evidence about that. The, the amount of preclinical data and basic scientific research is a lot yeah. Thank you. Is there any evidence of um, reduced BDNF or GDNF um, on the onset of drug addiction or the ex uh, excessive use of drugs? Well, actually, it, it, it's like that. Because uh, that would make sense that ibogaine, you know, kind of like you start using drugs, it decreases, then you get the ibogaine, it increases. Yeah, and, you can and that is a, a very good point because the, the thing is so complicated that actually when when you are, it is known that when you have, for example, cocaine or or morphine in, in animal models, that uh, modulates the it changes the expression of the neurotrophic factor themselves. So having a bogain is like another, another thing. I mean, the drugs of abuse themselves modulate the different expression of the neurotrophic factor. The point is that what, that what is the general idea is that uh, if you increase the, the GDNF in the BTA, that could be beneficial for the addiction. Yeah. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Well, thank you very much.